All right. So on tap for today, we have some updates on the HackFest and um, also on just a reminder to the workgroup chairs to please post their updates to the, to the list. And uh, I think another brief update on the communication tools. We'd really like to get that sort of squared away. Then um, <clears throat> Tomash is going to give us um, an introduction to the global synchronization log, GSL, something that uh, digital asset Holdings has been working on, and um, and then uh, I'd like to have a discussion on exit criteria, and then I think Brian wants to talk about the China Technical Working Group that's been proposed. Are there any other agenda items? If not, Todd. <clears throat> All right, just a couple really quick updates. Uh, December Hackfest. Um, we are still looking for a venue for December 5th and 6th. Uh, we, th we thought we had one place that ends up it won't work out. Uh, so if anyone on this call uh, has venue space in or near Manhattan, uh, please get in touch as soon as possible. We would like to get this locked down for the 5th and 6th of December. Uh, onward from there, work group updates. Uh, just a reminder uh, from, from Chris uh, as well last week, please uh, send any <laughs> updates to the TSC mailing list. Uh, so that people can stay in touch with what's happening in uh, the various working groups. Uh, and also, please make sure to update your wiki pages so that anyone that wants to participate can easily get up to speed and understand how to navigate the group. Um, and then lastly, communication tools. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to poke around with discourse, uh, please do so uh, as soon as possible. I think the other one Brian was asking people to look at was uh, Rocket Chat. Uh, if anyone has had a chance to do that, uh, definitely let us know your experience there. And Brian, I'm not sure if you're on yet uh, or if you had anything else to add there. Otherwise, Chris, I think we can um, move on to the main part of the agenda. Okay. Thanks, Todd. So I guess we should turn over the talking stick to Tomash. Pardon me. Hello, everybody. Uh, I thank you. I just received this uh, invitation to be a presenter. Just a moment. And hopefully, while Tomas is getting set up, hopefully everybody should have seen a note from uh, Dan O'Prey last evening um, with a with a link to a, a white paper. Uh, you should see in the meanwhile the white paper that we just sent to the to the TSC mailing list this morning. Could you confirm? Uh, I can yeah. see it. Yes. I can see it. Yeah, perfect. So this white paper is um, is an attempt to formulate. Um, uh, a module uh, of the digital uh, of the um, distributed ledger technology, and it is um, the, the purpose is really to encourage collaboration to work on this sub module. Um, I it is I, I think that it is quite an ask uh, um, to refer on this this uh, complex paper in, in a short walkthrough that I'm doing here. And uh, I apologize that uh, this was made uh, public just a few hours before this meeting. And I, I hope that after, the, after this presentation, you will have the time to go through it in full length and also provide feedback, which I would really appreciate. Um, so as said, uh, the purpose of this paper is to encourage a collaborative work in the hyperledger community. And uh, it is, uh, it is a, an output of our experience working with uh, regulated financial institutions uh, implementing the distributed ledger technology, um, whereby we both uh, try to use existing uh, distributed ledger stacks such as the Fabric and uh, 
and others uh, in the space, and also um, build our own solution. Um, and we, why we did this exercise, we, we learned that uh, the current stacks are not only inadequate uh, for most of the problems we, we try to solve, but they are also um, very hard to be to be used uh, in uh, in conjunction because they always uh, came as a full stack solution. They came with uh, uh, with, a, with a smart contract language, with an implemented ledger, with 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 their own in, own uh, uh, solution for the entire problem space. So the attempt we are making here is to to just focus on a very small piece of this entire problem space, uh, which is, we think, the foundation, could be the foundation of such a technology. Um, and this, this is what we call uh, the global, synchro uh, global synchronization log, and, uh, which is described in this document. The global synchronization log is, is basically um, a log of commitments and notifications and the notifications that guarantees the integrity of the distributed ledger store and uh, is auditable to the stakeholders um, uh, and form with, for, with other components together the actual distributed ledger. We, we found in our, uh, our, our, our uh, work in this space that the most most fundamental requirement in applying the technology in financial services is to preserve the privacy and uh, 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 privacy of sensitive information. Taking taking uh, in consideration these uh, these risk factors uh, that uh, um, I would like to elaborate on the problems area. Um, we think that physical segregation of the data, uh, of, of the sensitive data, is the only solution that would be acceptable to the uh, to to our client base. Um, maybe maybe this is best exemplified if I. If I go through the, uh, the individual solutions that we see, that, that we saw in other ledgers. Others try to solve the problem of, of, of sharing sensitive information uh, using either of the following four um, uh, ways. One is uh, to use an off, a kind of obfuscation where the transactions are visible to all parties, but the parties themselves have pseudonymous. This is, this is what you see in, in the case of Bitcoin. Another solution to address this was to use encryption, uh, which is uh, where the transaction carries a, a cyber tax and, and you uh, communicate uh, the keys in, in only to, to parties who are entitled to see the content. This is the, this is the approach that was uh, made by uh, Fabric. Uh, another way that we saw to handle this uh, was the use of zero-knowledge proofs, um, where the transaction carries a cryptographic proof of validity uh, that is convincing to the network, but it, it doesn't reveal, uh, only reveals the, the transaction's real meaning to the eligible parties. Um, the fourth solution is uh, segregated ledgers, where, where, people, where the Actual transactions are only communicated uh, and built into ledgers in a, on a bilateral or multilateral basis, only involving those who who are uh, uh, entitled to see the transaction. So they have only the replicated storage. And the fifth uh, solution is uh, um, the, where you only store uh, commitments in a in a global ledger and distribute uh, sensitive information. Uh, peer-to-peer uh, -to, -peer to involved parties. Now we think that the first two options um, are unfortunately not viable in our client base, mostly because of uh, uh, data dominance uh, uh, 
requirements and uh, concerns of forward secrecy in case of encryption. We, we also think that obfuscation is, although it could practically look, look well, it, it is not really secure against uh, a sophisticated data miner. So we closed out the first two uh, for not being applicable or not being viable and uh, evaluated some solutions uh, using the zero knowledge proofs but our current, as for our current knowledge, uh, they are either not uh, powerful enough or not have not received the scrutiny that, that would make them viable um, for our clients. The remaining two options, segregated ledgers and data execution commitments, um, are the ones which we further worked, uh, further dived into. And the GSL in particular, as described in this document, uh, is focused on an implementation where you have uh, data execution commitments. That means the network-wide blockchain carries fingerprints of sensitive data, and the actual data is segregated. I'd like to go a bit more into detail what the global synchronization lock can achieve uh, in, a, in, in that limited set of functionality that we think builds a building block. The three functions it can achieve is that it can build a relative order between transactions. The second one is it can ensure uniqueness of mutually exclusive events. So to translate it in a, into a, to a simple meaning, it can exclude double spans, it can exclude alternate alternate contracts uh, that peer uh, that parties might might have entered into. It can if, if there are two contracts in existence, it can choose the only one which is really valid. And it can serve as an assured notification mechanism. Uh, this is a concept that we invented with the GSL. Um, it is, we think, uh, necessary to also have the ability to notify, to, to, to ensure that the party who might be, in, who, who is involved in a transaction always learns about this transaction. This is, this is no longer a trivial statement as soon as uh, the, the ledger, um, the actual transaction data is segregated. So the ledger only carries proofs of the contracts. Um, a central, uh, a central uh, data structure of uh, the GSL we envision is the set of active contracts. Uh, we think of the ledger as being uh, defined by the set of active contracts. And we, we think of contracts as the off-chain business logic that, that describes the binding agreement between the parties. This is, um, this is not really a contract in a legal sense, but more in an algorithmic sense. But what's important in, in our think model is that this contract is, is as is a very static, um, is a very static description of the current agreement. And because of that, the set of active contracts describes the, the state of the world as it is understood by the GSL. The contract is a bit similar to the, to the state object you see in the CORDA framework, or could be, could be taught similar to the, to the chain code state or the word state as in fabric. But the real difference is that in our case, the active contracts are um, do not change. They, they are instantiated, the contract is instantiated and then replaced with subsequent contract or destroyed entirely. This is a, this is, we restrict a bit the expressiveness of contracts by that, uh, but not really fundamentally, since uh, one could express um, any state change by rewriting the contract and uh, one could express any procedure in a procedural sense uh, in a declarative functional way which we think is a more appropriate 
representation of of legal contracts we we work with. So the, the as I said, the GSL uh, carries proofs of existing contracts, and uh, this this it also um, we also suggest to maintain a set of active contracts, a fingerprint of this set of active contracts in the blockchain, so that if a, a party is joining the network, is able to very quickly learn from any other party the active contract set or a partial active contract set he is interested in, and verify this active contract set against the, uh, the fingerprint of this set in the blockchain. The GSL itself is maintained by appending transactions, just like any other blockchain implementation you saw. Committing a, a transaction to GSL changes the active contract set by adding or replacing, ad, adding a new contract or replacing an existing contract. And uh, in our case, these contracts are formulated in the demo language, but we don't think that this is a limiting property it's not designed to be a limiting, uh, syn a limiting synergy between between uh, GSL and our implementation. We think that it could be any kind of generic contract language that is useful for your uh, specific use case. The transaction carries the fingerprint or the evidence of the contract, and it also carries a list of uh, notifications. These notifications. Um, are derived from the actual contract. They are very likely the parties who are involved in the contract. And um, those notifications, which I, I, I'll go into the next section, those notifications are, are the second very important functionality of the, of the GSL. Now, now, I mentioned earlier that the contracts reference those contracts they, they replace. This remembers a bit of the um, Bitcoin UTXO model. Um, it is similar in the logic, and therefore it also has a similar vulnerability to Bitcoin. You know it, that, that in Bitcoin it is possible to analyze the, the transaction graph uh, implied by the UTXO uh, links by the links of, of transaction references. Now we would want to avoid that and therefore we split the actual GSL transaction into two components. One is only carrying the evidence of the uh, contract and the notifications and another part which we only share between uh, uh, a set of uh, auditors and a set of uh, or a set of uh, writers of the GSL, and we'll go into that a bit later, who are entitled to see it. Now, the not notifications that I mentioned uh, previously are not, again, not plain text notifications since uh, it would again reveal a lot of information about uh, what is happening on the ledger if you could tie individual events to parties. Therefore, we, we think that the notifications tokens used on the ledger have to be constructed such that they, are on, they can be only recognized by those who are consuming it or those who are creating it. Um, so they are cryptographic, share, uh, cryptographic tokens based on a shared secret between the, the notified party and the party who is notified. At first, uh, the next function of the GSL is certainly uh, ordering transactions. We think that uh, relative order would be sufficient, uh, but since uh, uh, capturing all dependencies between contracts explicitly on the chain might not be not be sufficient or feasible, we are rather going for a global order. Uh, defined by a blockchain, and this order uh, is has to be has to be established in case there are several um, participants or several uh, operators writing 
right in the GSL. The options we have here are uh, consensus, uh, consensus algorithm, algorithms, and uh, there we see in the Hyperledger Foundation two, two distinct approaches, uh, PBFT-like and uh, a probabilistic convergence. Uh, uh, an approach using probabilistic conversions of weight one. Uh, the GSL as we defined does not assume any particular consensus algorithm, uh, but um, is actually um, quite agnostic to, to that choice. At, as for a moment, we see that the uh, probabilistic convergence, uh, since it, is, it doesn't offer uh, finality on, on its own uh, is not yet an option for us, but we are we are uh, looking into that uh, very exciting research uh, currently ongoing in the, in the South of Lake project. Now, while we formulated this GSL, uh, we carefully separated uh, the contract implement the contract's interpretation and the contracts recordation on the ledger, and this certainly raises the question of how we how do we ensure the integrity of the ledger in a whole, the, the integrity in the sense of only recording valid contracts, and uh, although the GSL is not planned to or not not meant to be having visibility to the contracts themselves, the the way we, we we suggest to solve this is by by introducing uh, auditors to the invariance of the ledger. Uh, the GSL itself has several invariants. For example, the, uh, uh, the aforementioned uh, uniqueness of contracts uh, is is an invariant that can be checked by uh, an auditor of the contract references without without the need of being able to understand what the, what the contracts are. Similarly, uh, a, an auditor that has only a limited insight into the contract's meaning could audit the uh, notification sets whether they are appropriate for the type of contract that the lecture is recording. And, uh, at the, also, every participant uh, cons consuming the GSL uh, can certainly perform all the validation uh, that is attainable to that participant uh, with the data that is uh, available to the, to, to the participant. And thereby, to all those participants and all those auditors in their partially overlapping responsibilities and, and, and capabilities uh, can keep a check of the ledger, of the ledger's invariances uh, and, and integrity. Now, this is about our vision of the GSL in a functional sense. We have also a long list of non-functional requirements that we think a GSL would have to satisfy. I would only want to mention the first two. Uh, which is that we expect that the ledger will have to be able to process uh, several thousand transactions in the second, and that some contracts, in our sense, will have thousands of involved parties that need to be notified, and that transactions have millions of contracts updated in an atomic event. We also expect that the active contract set will have a, a, a magnitude of billions of contracts at any given time point. Now, um, the publication uh, you have in front of you is just the start of a series. Uh, I, I admit that this is a very high-level view. Um, it, it meant to be a high-level view, so you get accom accommodated to, to our thinking, and we also get timely feedback on how you think this resonates with the model. Um, of the Hyperledger Foundation, which, if we un in, in, in our understanding, aiming to introduce uh, enterprise uh, quality uh, modu modules 
for the distributed ledger technology. We think that this GSL is, as described in this document, is a very valid candidate for this module, and think that the functionality described here could be implemented with several of the currently incubated projects. And the digital asset also would want to work on, on this implementation. Um, and uh, well, welcome you to join this uh, this uh, in the sense of the ledger, the, the foundations uh, spread. And it's, uh, that's the, my conclusion to the document, which I hope. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to open it for questions, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, hi, hi, hi Tomas, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Richard here. This is uh, Richard, Maltby. I think this is, this, is, this is great. Thank you for sharing this. Um, I read the um, paper when, um, when, when Dan sent it around um, this morning, and, um, and it, was, um, it, it was great, really well written. And, um, and it, it, I thought it was helpful because there were so, so many pieces in it, and I guess as you've alluded to, so many pieces in it that seemed so close to, to, to what we're doing in Corda. But you'd also gone slightly further. You'd formalized some concepts that we'd been less clear about when we'd, um, when we'd been um, writing these things and, and articulated a useful set of concepts as a requirements around notification. I also like the, um, the actual concrete uh, non-functionals you included in there. Um, I had a question to make sure I've understood it correctly about this validation and notification. Um, did I hear correctly that the the people who can commit to the the GSL, um, I think you called them, I think you called them auditors, the people who can commit to it um, have full visibility and by committing or, or attesting that they have verified the transactions? And that's my first question. Well, people who are committing, or, or let's say people who are creating a transaction, so creating a contract with, with other parties, certainly have a visibility to that contract because they are party of it. Now, they, they, they propose this commitment to the ledger, which is then recorded to the ledger. Uh, this is not, not an auditor role. Uh, an auditor, what we call an auditor, is, is somebody, some, some function who is uh, auditing an invariant of the ledger, which one of it is probably is, is, is something that you call a uniqueness service, which uh, ensures that the ledger has the, has, has the right uh, properties. Uh, so this is a distinct, distinct function. It's not necessarily uh, the same thing. Or ledger integrity guarantees, or ledger integrity is guaranteed by the by the concept of uh, participants, auditors, and those who are writing the ledger. Cool. Okay. So because we have the same, I think we have the same the same approach here in one dimension. Just wanted to check. So if I if I were feeling perverse, I could create a transaction where the private part of it is is invalid. Um, and you know, I, I'd only screw myself, I guess, because it would quickly be discovered. But I could, in principle, commit that to the ledger and consume consume an input inappropriately. Is that is that correct, or is that prevented somehow? Well, this is not something that we th we uh, we think is a realistic example. Uh, yeah, certainly, yeah. those those who are writing the ledger are also also doing the validation of it. Uh, to what extent it depends on their entitlement or it depends on the configuration. So what, what I'm describing here is a concept of overlapping responsibilities of ensuring the ledgers. And what we are aiming here is to come up with a design that gives, uh, gives a large flexibility of uh, creating those distinct sets of responsibility that can overlap and then concept uh, and show that the lecture is okay. Cool. Cool. And just just as quickly just a quick, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And another very second question. Um, the second question. Am I right in thinking that the the way the not the way I should think about notifications is let's imagine I create a transaction and um, I'm assuming from context that you're using a UTXO style model. So so there'd be some concept of verifying the transaction. 
and and the the business logic that verifies it is also responsible for ensuring that that transaction has I'm using the wrong terminology here but um, ensuring the transaction has specified correctly the set of people who should be notified so that the transaction can only be considered valid if it also specifies the right people to be notified and that's how you lock those two things together yes uh, we said uh, one, one, one there's a statement in the paper that or we assume that uh, service that validates the contract uh, considers the contract only valid if it also, if, if the transaction also notifies the right people, whatever this definition means, the right people, it's certainly those who are affected in some way uh, by the contract. Sure, got yeah. it. That, that's, that's really clear. Th thanks, Thomas. I think there are a couple of other comments in the chat. <clears throat> I see a lot. Uh, where do I start? Uh, quick question: Approximately, how much more efficient would Snark have to be to be a viable solution for your application? I, I think it is certainly uh, the there is an, also a, a scalability issue with Snarks, uh, but, but the real problem is that these kind of proofs uh, do not cover all the invariants that we would want to check. So it's, I, I don't think that it is just a question of scalability. It is, it is also a question of applicability of uh, the current zero knowledge proof algorithms. Of the current like, practical zero knowledge proof algorithms. Uh, the next question. Um, in the order of 25 seconds, several people working on making it more efficient. Actually, uh, okay. <laughs> Um, how to ensure the notification be received by every affected stakeholder? I think this was covered uh, by my answer to uh, Richard. This looks like a call up coin meta protocol approach. Uh, the blockchain orders transactions, blah, blah. And my question is how do you ensure that both parties to the transaction are constructing the same, same ledger state? Well, I, I would say uh, that this would be, uh, it would be mischaracterized to be a, a call up coin or meta protocol approach. This is a, uh, uh, this is a, a suggestion to. Um, modularize the problem. Um, we, we think that this can, uh, the hyperledger or, or this technology or industry in a whole can only advance if we, if we began working on components which are well defined and can be uh, reused across different implementations. So we can also compare their performance and figure out what what is the right thing to do, what the right solution to do. I think we cannot cannot advance this in this industry any 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 further if we are just proposing full stack solutions one after the other which which find a solution for every detail of the problem in some other way than, than we saw before. So is there an implementation that mirrors these requirements, a reference implementation? Uh, well, at Digital Asset, we work on an implementation that is, I wouldn't call it reference, in, reference implementation because it is uh, due, due to our commitments to deliver to our clients. They, it is an implementation pretty much tailored to the current needs of our customer. Um, so I admit that we do some shortcuts there to, to be able to deliver there. So I would not call it a reference implementation, but it might at some point be uh, be powerful enough for that purpose. But I, I don't think that it would be the it would be the, the right approach to on our, from, from our side to, to aim for such a reference <coughs> implementation. I would rather see uh, this idea uh, uh, inspiring the, the, the already incubated projects in, in the Hyperledger Foundation. So we so we, we work together in this direction. Any further questions? 
Um, so, so Tomas, this is Chris. So, I, I guess the question is, so, <laughs> what are your intentions? Is is, D, is digital assets intending to contribute something? And given, you know, as Richard suggested, and I think as was suggested in the chat, and certainly as I felt as I was reading through this, there's an awful lot of similarities to things that are already sort of in flight. How do you how do you see this, you know, sort of moving forward? Do you envisage an external component that be maintained? Do you envisage, you know, helping to morph the capabilities that we have and other things towards this? Well, first, well, first of all, first of all, I think we made a very important contribution by proposing a modularization to the problem, um, and we are, we are, we hope that you follow our argument. That's arguments. That's why the paper is. Is very verbose, and we made a lot of effort making it, making our points very clear why we think this is a this is a viable uh, or, or meaningful separation of concepts. So this is this is our first this is our first contribution, and I hope that this is will be appreciated, and we we are also committed to contribute a, a coding effort. Uh, and along these lines, uh, and proving if, which which we are actually convinced possible, if the incubated projects, including Fabric and Corda, can be, can act as a GSL or can offer those services. So 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 Richard speaking here. Um, um, there's, there's, there's. Given we've we've only recently seen this, there's um, still more um, thinking we need to do inside R3. But just, just reading through it this morning and um, and 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 then listening to Thomas's answers now, um, I, I'd, I'd certainly be interested in that. This looks like a. Okay, the, you, you, every sometimes you, you you dream of um, receiving a set of requirements that are a perfect fit, and um, and this is not quite that. There are some things we don't have, but it's it's um, it, it's remarkably aligned to how we see things. So I, I'd love to continue to collaborate on this. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Dan from Digital Asset. Um, just to add to that, we, we do intend to follow up with a more technical document uh, at some point in the near future, and are obviously happy to uh, participate on any TSC calls or have a you know an hour long uh, discussion once people have had time to to read and digest uh, the document. But yeah, the very much the goal is to stimulate discussion, uh, as Tomash said, to to move towards. A more sort of modular approach, which I think is in line with uh, Brian's concept of a, an umbrella organization for ideally reusable uh, modules across multiple different implementations. Uh, and then also, you know, we continue to explore the, the current projects and we're committed to, you know, in the future, hopefully adopting um, an open source project that, that does meet these needs. Um, and those needs will evolve from feedback from clients and as well from community uh, around some of the ideas that are proposed here. Um, but I think the goal is, is very much in line with the modularization uh, of Hyperledger. Well, if there are no further questions, then I'll hand back to Chris. Um, so, so this is Ram. Um, you know, glad to see this uh, contribution, Tamash. A very well written paper. Um, you know, as you know, we've been working on the architectural work group, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, in the next uh, meeting we can, uh, you know, you can do a, a, a deep dive uh, as part of this to see if this needs to change the modularity. Uh, um, um, as we've defined so far in the group. I, I don't think it overrides anything that we, we worked on the, in the group. And, and, and we'll be very pleased if you take the, those ideas and consider them. Great. Looking forward to uh, more discussions on this uh, next week. This is uh, Vipin. Uh, Tomas, great work. Uh, 
I think it it feeds into the whole uh, modularization uh, approach that uh, we have been actively championing um, in the architecture working group and other places uh, as well. Uh, even when we introduced the member membership services last time, uh, we were uh, talking about uh, making it uh, more generic and uh, as a utility available to the multiple uh, uh, incubated um, incubator uh, digital uh, ledgers available to us. Uh, this is a great uh, approach, and let's hope that uh, we can put some more meat into it uh, and get uh, you know, like I like I was asking, uh, some kind of an implementation or more technical paper would be very welcome. Thank you. Yes, I as Dan mentioned, we will follow up. Well, I apologize. I had to step away for a bit and I missed all the excitement. So I'm not sure where we are. We're Did just we waiting for 10 more seconds for questions. Okay. If not, I guess thanks. Were there any actions that I, that I missed that I should just know about? We promise to follow up uh, both with uh, further technical details and uh, publications and also with uh, uh, contributing work along these lines to the incubator projects. OK, thanks. Kreta, stop it. Stop it. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, what's next? Talk. I think uh, there was, ah, exit criteria. Um, so a while back, we had a discussion and we worked on, I have a link, I have a little link here someplace. Where's the wiki? Uh, there's the link. Um, to the um, to the exit criteria um, wiki and um, and I think that we sort of again I just want to make sure that we're all yeah, right a dog chain um, that you know that we're all still sort of aligned you know we've had a little bit of a changing of the guard but basically I just wanted to again review the exit criteria because I think the fabric team is looking you know as we you know it, do our sort of march towards you know a V1 um, at the end of Q1. It's likely that you know we'll want to sort of exit from incubation, um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we're all sort of up to speed and familiar with where you know with what we I think agreed in the past about the exit criteria, and um, that uh, you know that that would be the sort of the yardstick that we would measure. Um, any any projects that seek to sort of uh, exit from from incubation into active status. So I'll just remind people. I don't know if we need to have a discussion at this point in time, um, but you know if if there are concerns or issues, then I would suggest that we take it to the to the mailing list and have you know have whatever discussion we need to have. And uh, uh, if we need to if we need to amend them, we'll amend them. But um, uh, I just sort of put it out there and, and open it up for any any discussion, or um, or if not, we can we can move on to um, to Brian's topic. Uh, here, crickets. So I'm gathering that that's agreement that. Those are the criteria, and those are what we'll use to sort of measure suitability for exit. Is that right? Uh, it, at least in my case, I just haven't had a chance to look at it, Chris, recently. So. Same here, Chris. Oh. 
I, again, I don't want to, you know, sort of force a decision, but I, I do want to sort of, you know, sort of re, re raise the, the, the topic just so that it's, it's front and center. So um, I guess what we can do is, um, and again, I'm not going to be around for two weeks, um, for the next two weeks, but, you know, maybe we, if I could ask the members of the TSC to sort of review the exit criteria and, um, um, and, and if there's any, you know, comments or suggestions to add them to the, to the wiki and send them to the mailing list so that we can have the necessary discussion. And, um, and then maybe uh, what I'll suggest, Todd, is that um, sometime in the next week or two that if, either if there is no dis, uh, discussion or if there is, if we can just bring that to closure and, um, uh, you know, within the next couple of weeks, that would be good. Can, Everybody agree with that? Yeah. Hey, this is Brian. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Um, can I suggest we actually uh, okay, do a little bit of uh, just one last kind of review on the exit criteria? Um, I think it has some dated things like uh, GitHub repo, et cetera, but just, just one last pass and then give it one week. And then um, starting next week, we actually develop a checklist of sorts, um, something we can use the wiki to track progress um, for each of our projects in incubation um, to see, you know, did it meet criteria one, criteria two, criteria three, uh, just so that, you know, we have a trackable sense of progress against these um, and something that collectively the group can own rather than, you know, an, another email thread that may get lost in something like this. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll volunteer my staff to, to help with that process. Um, but I think, you know, some way of formally tracking it would be, would be good and, and fair to all the projects in incubation. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I certainly think, yeah, that a checklist would actually be a, um, a positive um, thing to come out of this. And a wiki page that tracks it. That's kind of my yep. main thrust. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, Brian. Or it's probably thanks, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I put it all on Todd's shoulders. <laughs> Okay. I just come up with the um, ideas. Yeah, actually, then, I them. <laughs> uh, right. uh, so then the, the last topic, I think, is the China Technical Working Group, Brian. So, um, yeah. Well, um, just real quick, it sounded like there was generally positive uh, responses to that. Um, I, I'm not prepared yet to make a formal proposal, but I'd like to do that uh, next week. I think as part of that formal proposal, the one thing in my kind of sketch uh, that that you know would be would be helpful to put in the proposal would be naming um, some co-chair people for that committee um, uh, for that working group. I'm sorry for the working group. I'm not looking to set up you know something with 11 people you know like the uh, the the TSC. Um, nor is it something where there's intended to be a lot of voting because generally it'll be more of a support group and, and conversational rather than having a lot of decisions that need to be made. Um, but the idea is naming a few specific people to be links between this world and that world, <laughs> between this working with this committee and, and that working group and, and, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. So, um, so a, are there any other comments people wanted to make on that before I kind of write it up as a formal proposal for next week? B, does anyone oppose to that timeline and C, are there are there what what process should we go to through to name those individuals? I think it should be more than one, but um, uh, I'm open to that as well. So this is Chris. Um, I I think I sent this to the list. I'm not sure. I'm definitely you know as as our others um, uh, very very positive about this. Um, I I suggested that um, there be a tie between that group and this group. And that um, you know we invite um, one of the chairs or all of them, but I mean again, it's an awkward time in the evening for um, uh, for our, our colleagues in China, and so I was just suggesting that maybe they could sort of because you know we would have multiple chairs that they could sort of take on a rotational assignment of sitting in on this and any of the other work group calls. Um, to serve as that sort of liaison to be, you know, up to speed and be able to communicate that with their colleagues in China, um, right. you know, whether it's right. to, you know, have a discussion on their their re regular calls or, or what have you or WeChat, but 
Um, I, I definitely think that that would be a, a good thing, and I, I definitely think that multiple chairs would be um, a good idea. Other thoughts? Okay, then um, what I'll do is I'll solicit volunteers for the chair um, and uh, on the TSC list. Uh, and if, if it's an overwhelmingly crushing number, I may exercise a bit of executive kind of <laughs> prerogative in, in narrowing that, that list down. But uh, um, in general, again, I'm really happy with the response that's come in and uh, I look forward to putting a more formal proposal on the agenda for next week. Okay, and uh, so, so I just notice in the chat that Vipin was asking how the China Technical Working Group will coexist with the TSC. I think we answered that, but Vipin, just to make sure that you're good. Uh, yeah, how it would respond. I mean, the, the, the chair is just like you say, either rotate or all of them show up on the TSC calls here, report in from time to time on the activity there. Um, and it's I definitely see the TWGC as accountable to this TSC. Uh, you know, there's, there's that link there. You know, if, if things aren't working, then we, we uh, look for new chairs, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, but that's that's the connection for me. So it'll be purely a way to uh, socialize our, um, uh, I mean, whatever activity that we are engaged in and the activity in China, um, in, in the Chinese ecosystem. Uh, and make the make the bridge because of of course the language barrier uh, and that yeah. kind of okay yeah and, and um, exactly uh, uh, to, uh, yeah. to to give them a sense of local local support local uh, uh, um, identity so uh, yeah uh, hi hi this is Charles from One Dark Roof. Uh, yeah, I think it's not necessarily the uh, language rather than the, the time zone. Uh, I'm actually in Silicon Valley, so I'm, I can attend in early morning. But over there, 9 o'clock, uh, asking all our Chinese members to join. It's actually a, a bit difficult. So uh, me and uh, Julian, we are organizing the Chinese hackathon these days, so we are just busy. Uh, but so we, we will be collecting the, the feedbacks as well, because all of the members in China will be participating in the hackathon, the Shanghai hackathon, uh, supposed to be happening in uh, January next year. So but, but I do like the idea uh, as a gateway or bridge uh, to cover the, the big communities there. There's overwhelming interest because previously the interest, of, interest was around Israel and then there's more and more interest uh, from within China. So it's, it's a really good momentum there. Yeah, thanks Charles. We're really looking forward to it and, and I guess uh, this is we haven't yet uh, publicly announced the, um, the the hackathon yet, but we should soon. Um, uh, so that's early January. I think it's seventh and eighth. Is that correct? Um, is the dates we're looking at? Um, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting out there as well. And I think anybody on the TSC who you know uh, could could make the trip would be uh, well rewarded for doing that. Uh, from a, just the community out there is tremendous. The support from our partners, you know, Wanda, Huawei and IBM's China regional office has been really tremendous. And so definitely encourage people, if you've got the travel budget, um, to, uh, to find a way to get out there for that time. We can make it really worth your while. Cool, Excellent. okay. Well, um, I'll put a proposal together for next week. All right, super. Um, and, I, and I think I also heard you say you were sort of already putting out the call for... Yeah, I'll do that. Super. All right. Well, unless there's any other topics, I think we can proceed to end of job. And uh, thank everybody, and I'll see you all in about three weeks. Actually, no, that'll be Thanksgiving. All right. So I'll see you in a month. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Ciao. Take care. Thank you.